Hello, I'm Savannah Haverson, and I am the Community Relations Representative here at University House Issaquah. Before we start with today's presentation, I would like to share a little bit about our beautiful community. University House Issaquah is a premier retirement community located near the foothills of the Cascade Mountains, where residents enjoy access to nearby Issaquah shopping centers, as well as beautiful views of the Issaquah Alps and the year-round natural beauty of our two Gordon uh, garden courtyards. We are honored to be partnered with the University of Washington Retirement Association, which gives our residents access to classes through the UW's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Our residents share a passion for knowledge, art, and culture, and a desire to remain active in the mind, body, and spirit. If you would like to learn more, please give us a call at 425-557-4200. Zero, zero. And now on to our main event. We are honored to host Nicole Casado and Tina Hall, who will be presenting on assisted living versus nursing homes. What are the differences? Nicole Casado started serving seniors in 1996. Starting as a shared employee in an old fashioned nursing home, she dabbled in every department. Over her long career, she has been working in both assisted living and skilled nursing and rehab settings, specializing in program development, marketing, and leadership. A former executive director and regional sales and marketing lead, she is enjoying being back in rehab medicine as a community educator and liaison. Tina Hall with Era Living has worked in the senior housing and care field for over 15 years, both at retirement and assisted living communities and as an elder care advisor. And now I will turn it over to Tina. Thank you very much, Savannah. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. Well, I am gonna go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Okay. Give me a second to make sure that I can see my screen and we'll be in good shape. So thank you everyone for joining us today. You know, this is a question that plagues a lot of people. I think a lot of people don't quite understand that there is a really a pretty significant difference between assisted living communities and nursing homes. So today we have a lot of things we are going to cover. Uh, let's see, why is my screen not advancing? Ah, there we go. Okay, today we're going to talk first about assisted living communities. What are they? What's included in the monthly cost? What kinds of services are available in an assisted living community? Who's a fit? for an assisted living community? When might you consider moving to an assisted living community? And then what can you expect when you move in? And then we're going to turn it over to Nicole and she is going to talk through nursing homes, also called skilled nursing facilities, and explain what they are and what they do and the types of services they provide, a little bit about the admissions process, how things are paid for, and when you might need a nursing home, what that might look like. So, we're gonna just plunge on in. So just what is an assisted living community anyway? Well, the basic answer is this is a residential retirement community for people who are 62 or older, which provides some level of assistance with activities of daily living. And you're gonna hear me use that term every once in a while. Activities of daily living, basically, those are the things you do every day. That's taking a shower, maybe uh, getting dressed, grooming, you know, brushing your hair, brushing your teeth, um, maybe getting, getting a meal, having, some, having your medication. So these are the things you do every day. And in an assisted living community, there are people available to help you with those activities of daily living should you need them. Now, an assisted living community will have all kinds of different public spaces for the residents to use. They may have you know, a, a workout facility. Some have pools, some don't. Most will have a, a beauty salon. Um, some have libraries, theaters, game rooms, uh, pea patches, gardens, all kinds of, of different activity space that is specifically for their residents to use. And again, this will vary from community to community. So when you're looking at an assisted living community, you know, be sure to look for the amenities that are going to appeal to you um, and the activities that you enjoy. So residents have their own apartments and that apartment could range in size anywhere from a studio, to a one bedroom, two bedroom, sometimes even a three bedroom. And you as the resident furnish your own apartment and decorate it how you, how you prefer. So you really make it your home. Um, 
All of the assisted living community apartments are going to have a private bathroom and most have some type of kitchen facility. It might be a kitchenette or it may be a full kitchen, just sort of depends on the size of the apartment and the community that you're looking at. And most communities are gonna allow you to bring your cat and your dog or you know your, your favorite pet, um, probably not a pony, but you know, um, you can bring your, your beloved furry friend. Um, they also provide various social activities, educational activities. Usually there are exercise programs, exercise classes. So you can just walk out your door and go on down and do sit and be fit if you feel like it in the morning. Um, walking groups, all kinds of different activities. There's also transportation available to doctor's appointments, to grocery shopping and to various outings. Um, and then best of all, I think with an assisted living community, it provides you an ongoing support network of peers. Okay, sorry, I keep losing my, my, my view to, to move my slide forward. There we go. So you might wanna know what is included in the cost when you move into an assisted living community. What does your monthly rent include? Well, clearly it's going to include the apartment itself. It's also going to include all of your meals, which will be taken in the dining room. And that's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, lots of places have open dining available. Some of them have scheduled dining, uh, but all your meals are included. Your utilities are also going to be included with the exception of phone. And typically high-speed internet is not included, although a lot of places have basic cable and you may have a wireless internet connection throughout the building. And that's gonna vary from, 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 from community to community as well. But typically your phone's not included and oftentimes not the high-speed internet. Some transportation services are included as I alluded to. You're going to be able to have regularly scheduled uh, uh, transportation to doctor's appointments. Usually the community will do one or two weekly outings to grocery stores or to other shopping venues. So you can pick stuff up if you, you know, want to keep some snacks in your apartment um, and that sort of thing. Lots of activities and classes. And this is, I think, really one of the beauties of, of, of congregate living is that opportunity for social engagement and, and ongoing uh, learning and classes and, and things to really keep your, your mind and your body engaged and learning. So maintenance and upkeep is also going to be included in that monthly rent, as well as weekly housekeeping services, which also usually includes linen and towel service. So they're gonna come in and they're gonna strip your bed and, and wash everything and bring it back in and, and make your bed back up, um, which is nice. It's one less thing that you have to do. Believe me, that's something I'd like to give up. Um, it's also going to include various concierge type services. There is usually a, a front desk where someone is available, if not 24 hours a day, then usually at least the hours that people are awake, but typically it's 24 hours a day, there's, there's somebody that's going to be available at, at the front desk for any kind of emergency, um, assistance that you might need, or just questions. Now, I did tell you that, that um, uh, assisted living communities help you with your activities of daily living. But the monthly care plan itself, which is going to be based on a nurse's assessment, is actually a separate cost. And the reason that's a separate cost is that is variable based on your specific care needs. And speaking of care needs, you might be wondering what types of services, what kind of care you can access in an assisted living community. So they are going to provide a variety of care services to just help and support you in your activities of daily living. This might be medication management um, or assistance with your medication. It might be assistance with, with showering or bathing. You know, maybe it's just you, you have a concern with getting in and out of the shower because that is a place where a lot of people happen to trip and fall. And so for safety, you may, may have somebody that's standing by. Uh, maybe they're just handing you a towel. It just kind of depends on what you need. Dressing and grooming assistance is available in an assisted living community. Doesn't necessarily mean you need everything, but maybe you, you have arthritis in your shoulder and getting that blouse on can be a bit challenging. Well, you've got people that can help you with that. Um, toileting assistance, and there are a variety of health management services that are available in an assisted living community um, under their licensing capacity. 
Now, there are some services that an assisted living community is not allowed to provide. And once we get into the skilled nursing piece of this presentation, Nicole's going to talk a little bit about some of those services. Um, but the, the more complex services you have, the more expensive your care plan is going to be. And the types of services vary from community to community. Some communities opt to provide the highest level of care allowable under an assisted living license. Other communities can do pretty high levels of care, but they may not go to the absolute limit of their license. So it's a good idea to ask questions about the care services that an assisted living community might provide and what services they may not be able to provide, just so that if you have a condition that points towards needing a very high level of care, you'll know whether this community is going to be able to meet those needs as they progress. So prior to moving in, you would meet with a community nurse, usually an RN, and they would do an assessment. They'll ask you a lot of personal questions to get to know you and to understand what types of services you might need or at least will benefit from. And then once this assessment is completed, the nurse will also work with your physician and you know, be able to get a good understanding of what your needs are, what your health situation is, and then they will design a care plan specifically addressing your individual care needs. So care plans are not a one size fits all. They are a one size fits you based on the assessment that is done with the community health nurse. The care itself is overseen by a nurse, but it is primarily provided by CNA, Certified Nursing Assistants, or similarly um, credentialed individuals uh, who will come to your apartment for your scheduled services, whether that's daily, every other day, it just really depends on what you need. So you have a lot of control on, um, when it comes to how often someone is coming to your apartment to provide assistance. They're not going to be sitting with you um, and providing companion care for hours at a time. They're really only there when you need them. You also have the option of being able to push a call button or pull a call cord to have someone come to your apartment in the event that you need non-scheduled assistance. But um, you know whether that's an emergency or whether it's part of your care plan that you need occasional assistance with something. You can call on people and they will respond, come to your apartment, give you the help that you need. Now, in an assisted living community, it's important to understand that your costs for your care plan are not going to be covered by Medicare or health insurance, which sometimes is a shock to people. Costs are covered with private funds, or in some cases by long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance usually requires that you have a waiting period before your policy can be triggered and that you need two to three services provided by the assisted living community. Um, not everyone has a long-term care insurance policy. So for most people paying for assisted living is going to come out of your private savings, your personal funds. There are communities that do accept Medicare, excuse me, Medicaid, sorry, a little slip there, but those are not terribly common. And those that do accept that type of, of payment um, usually have a waiting period of anywhere from two years to four years before they will accept any type of Medicaid payment. So it really is private funds for the most part. Sorry. I keep doing this to myself or I, my, uh, my scrolling tool disappears and I have to keep finding it. So I appreciate your patience with me. So the question a lot of people have, have is, is an assisted living community the right fit? Is it the right thing for you? And if it is, when might you consider moving to an assisted living community? And I think, um, the most important thing when you are starting to consider moving to a community, the most important thing is to really have a realistic understanding of your own needs and to ask yourself some questions. For example, are you starting to need a little help with one or more of your activities of daily living? 
Is it, is it, you know, is it becoming cumbersome for you to handle certain activities on a regular basis? Might be time to think about an assisted living community as an option. The other thing is, do you enjoy seeing people? Are you getting enough time socializing and connecting with others? How often are you seeing people? You know, it's, it's, um, it's not uncommon for as we age to become more and more isolated as friends move away, sometimes pass away, or maybe we just don't have the mobility we used to to get out and see people. <laughs> or we're in the middle of a pandemic and it's really difficult to get out and see people or to have people over. So that, that social component often is, is uh, the reason that people seek out an assisted living community to stay emotionally and socially engaged and healthy. So are you driving? Or should you consider giving up the keys? Whoops, I just advanced my slides by accident. That was interesting. Um, back to the slide. Okay, are you, are you still driving? Is it becoming challenging? If you, are, if you are finding that driving is becoming cumbersome, you might want to consider an assisted living community because remember, transportation is included and it will allow you to get to your various appointments and the places you need to go. Also, if you're living in a fairly remote area or maybe in an area that's just challenging to get to, maybe you have home care coming in to help you a couple times a week, but then we get a huge snowstorm on Christmas and everything is sort of soft in and nobody can get to you. It makes it challenging then to have your needs met when it's, when it's hard for people to get to you. Um, so that's a question to really consider. Is cooking starting to become a challenge? You know, if you, you maybe you used to love to cook and, and now it's it's really a hassle, it's, it's really a chore. So you're living more on processed foods or microwavable meals, which really are not the healthiest option for any of us. How does your life compare now to how it was five years ago? You know, you, you may find that you are not doing a lot of the things that you used to enjoy. And if, if that's something you're missing, again, might be time to consider a move, you know, and then think about as your needs progress, what's that going to look like five years from now? Is your, is your current environment going to be able to meet your needs? And if you have to make a lot of adjustments to your current environment, what is that going to be like financially? Is that, is that a feasible plan? Um, now, I'm not saying that an assisted living community is a perfect fit for a lot of people, but these are really good questions to really consider and drill into when you're trying to decide on what the right fit is for you and when you should think about moving. You know, consider your mobility. Have you had a fall in the last year or a significant health scare? Oftentimes that, that means there are other things that may be coming and it might be a good idea to be in a situation where you have support. Even if it's just in case, there is a peace of mind that comes from knowing that you are going to have a level of support should anything happen. And these are kind of some interesting questions, but also to think about how would moving affect your time with your family and your relationship with your family? For example, you may have a son or daughter who you see a couple times a week, but when they're there, they're really functioning more as a caregiver. And that can feel awkward to your family relationship. You may want to go back to just feeling like this is your family, not your caregiver. And then the last question to think about really is, who do you want to make that decision for you? It is very easy to put off making a decision and to put off making a plan for your future. But one of the dangers of doing so is if you have an unexpected health crisis and you are unable to make the decision for yourself, how confident do you feel that your family or your durable power of attorney is going to make the choice that you would want? They're going to select the community that feels best for you. I think most of us want to control that choice on our own. I know I certainly do. Um, but again, it, it varies from person to person. And then you might wonder, okay, what is the process like? What can I expect when I am moving to an assisted living community or preparing to move to an assisted living community? It's actually a pretty simple process. So once you've toured and you've asked a lot of questions, 
and you've chosen a community that you feel fits your needs, not just from the physical perspective, but also your personality and the geographic area you want to be in, you know, then you select the apartment that you want from studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, if you really don't want to give up a lot of space. Um, and then your community relations team. So for example, Savannah at University House Issaquah would work with you to provide you all kinds of information to help make the move easier for you. That could be downsizing specialists, that could be moving companies, that could be a, a senior real estate specialist. Um, definitely ask them to help you and to provide you with services because they vetted a lot of different sort of adjacent industries to help you through that entire process because that can feel kind of overwhelming by yourself. So during this process, you will meet with the community health nurse and they will complete your assessment. And then they'll use this plus the health notes from your primary care physician to develop your care plan. This assessment needs to happen before you can move into a community so that they have a really good understanding of what your needs are and can help set you up for success with a care plan that's going to meet your needs from the day you walk in the door. You'll fill out moving paperwork with the executive director. There's a lot of paperwork, I, I'm sorry to say, but you know it covers a lot of, of important scenarios and, um, and they'll walk you through and answer questions with, with, with all of that, with all of your moving paperwork. And then once you've made the move, honestly, that first week, whenever you have a significant change, it's gonna feel a little disorienting. You know, and, and I think in that first week, a lot of people have a little bit of, of fear of, oh my gosh, has, has, is this the right choice for me? Um, and I'd like to assure you, don't worry about that. Because the, the thing is, even though it feels disorienting being in that new environment, you're gonna find that you have a lot of help and support, not only from the staff, but also from residents themselves. Most communities have um, a resident um, ambassador program or a welcoming committee or some other program where they will pair you up with a resident who has similar interests, maybe a similar background, or has just volunteered to be the welcoming committee to, to help new residents feel good and feel at home. And they are going to show you around. They'll invite you to eat with them, for meal periods, and they'll just help orient you to, to your new surroundings. You'll also get a resident handbook from your community that'll give you all kinds of information on various programs. You'll get um, activity calendars. You'll get a lot of support. Um, so just sort of relax into that and, and let, people, let people help and, and let them fuss over you. It's really okay. And then pretty soon you're gonna start feeling at home and make friends and then it'll be nice. That way you can, let go of some of the stress and the tasks that you are currently focusing on and be able to really immerse yourself in activities and social opportunities and classes and, you know, really kind of whatever feels good to you. And now I've kind of come to the end of, of my summary of assisted living communities. And in a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole and she is going to walk you through skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes and explain what they do, which though there is overlap and there is similarity to assisted living communities, they are actually quite uh, distinctly different. Does anyone have any questions before we, we move on to Nicole? And Savannah, I can't see the chat box. So if there are, you'll have to let me know. Not seeing any questions yet. Okay. Well, I will encourage people to put their questions into the chat box as they occur, if something comes up along the way. And at this point, I'm gonna move on to uh, the first slide and turn it over to Nicole to start talking. Nicole, it's all you. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, I apologize, I cannot advance my own slides because I had all sorts of technical issues this morning and actually ended up on my 24 year old son's laptop to make this happen because my mic wouldn't work. So I'm gonna be winking at Tina a ton so she could advance slides for me. So in skilled nursing, we're really talking about two different um, service lines. We're talking about um, folks that need that level of care, which I'll go into in a minute, um, for the rest of their life. 
And then we're talking about people who need skilled nursing and rehabilitation for what I refer to as a pit stop. So what we're offering in skilled nursing, um, we're offering the highest level of care outside of a hospital setting. Most people do not need that to live their lives. And in Washington in particular, we have a very robust adult family home um, system here that can meet really high level of care beyond what assisted living can meet. And so it is very, very rare that someone needs to live in a nursing home for the entirety of their days. Uh, so most of the time, someone will end up in a skilled nursing facility um, in a holding pattern while they have recovered from whatever landed them there as they're looking for a lower level of care. So what we're doing in skilled nursing um, is gonna be daily IV antibiotics. That's something that is beyond what home health could handle. Daily wound care, again, beyond what home health could handle. Care needs that exceed the level of care that assisted living can offer, such as someone who needs some sort of a mechanical lift or a Hoyer lift to get from surface to surface or a heavy two person assist from surface to surface where the, the weight is actually being bared for them um, or sliding scale diabetic management because that requires that an LPN or an RN physically be by their side 24 seven to interpret blood sugars and to, um, to follow physician orders for insulin. There are times also where people will go into skilled nursing care for end of life care um, because they are passing away rapidly, quite frankly, and we already have all of the equipment in place um, as far as uh, medical beds and things to help folks stay comfortable while they pass. Um, so in skilled nursing, um, in conjunction with all of those things that as the nursing piece, we're also really focused on rehabilitation and getting you back on your feet and, and out the door and back to your previous living situation. So uh, physical therapy daily or six times a week would be something that someone would go to skilled nursing and rehab for. Because again, home PT could handle uh, maybe two to three times a week, but not daily. And so physical therapy is gonna be focusing on large body movements, overall strength, Occupational therapy is the fine motor skills, um, grooming yourself, bathing yourself, brushing your teeth, getting your buttons, your zippers, your shoelaces, your socks on and off. And then speech therapy, everyone you know, thinks of speech therapy as working on someone's swallow after an event such as a stroke, but also they actually also um, focus on cognition as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our accommodations and skilled nursing are going to be very similar to a hospital. They're going to be a shared or private room, not an apartment. Uh, it's going to be very handicap accessible. So everything is going to be um, handicap accessible, hospital beds, um, you know, walkers, wheelchairs, four point canes, uh, risers on the toilets, lowered sinks with wheelchair access underneath. Not a very home-like environment, frankly. Um, very much a hospital environment because again, most people, this is a pit stop, the tune-up between hospital and getting back home again. Uh, they're gonna have a rehab gym of some sort. There is a dining room that is also a shared activity space, though a lot of um, clients who are in rehab do dine in their room. Um, most facilities, are really an old fashioned nursing home. You know, before we had assisted livings and adult family homes back in the 60s, then all the options were for care was nursing homes. Uh, with the um, expansion of assisted livings and adult family homes, nursing homes thankfully have pivoted and are not the, the holding house of um, the elderly and seniors anymore. And I, I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing because we are now having most seniors living in very home-like um, environments. So most uh, skilled nursing facilities are about half to three fourths um, rehab and then just a little bit of skilled nursing. There are a few uh, facilities that are newer, such as who I'm associated with Mission, that is just short-term rehab only and it's all private suites. That's all we're doing. We don't do any skilled uh, long-term care. So staff in a skilled nursing facility is gonna be very, 
much like the hospital, there's a medical director who would become your physician, your primary care physician, while you are getting um, care in the facility. You would still leave the facility for specialists. Um, so if you were in short-term rehab after a hip replacement, for instance, the medical director would oversee your day-to-day -day pain management, but you would still go to that orthopedic doctor on a regular basis, and they, they would take x-rays and increase your weight-bearing status and communicate with the house physician. This can be really handy in end-of-life situations because if someone is in pain, we, can, we have the doctor on speed dial and we can get someone's pain meds um, changed just right away. Whereas um, if hospice were involved, we'd be waiting for a nurse to come out and assess and things like that. Um, so in the skilled nursing setting, the LPN or the RN is gonna be administering your medication, managing your IV and providing wound care. There's also usually a wound care specialty doctor that comes in rounds as well weekly. Um, CNAs are gonna be assisting with bathing, feeding and dressing, but they do it in tandem with the occupational therapy team so that they're getting you back to your prior level of function or your highest level of function. And then of course, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy for um, those needs. And then, you know, there's also a, a large support staff um, such as, you know, uh, cooks, office administrators, social workers, things like that. It's very, a very busy environment with all of the staff. So the admission process right now is a little bit different because of COVID. So we always need a history and physical. We always need a current medication list signed by a physician. Uh, we also need this pesky form called a PASAR, which is a mental health screening tool. Uh, that's in place because historically our country's not done a great job taking care of folks with mental health diagnoses and they've ended up institutionalized. And so uh, every state has a pass our process that if you do have a mental health diagnosis, the skilled nursing facility is aware of it. And if it's severe enough to be impacting your day-to-day -day life, then you're going to have a higher level of social work following you to make sure that we really do get you out of the facility and not institutionalize you. It's a, it's a really good thing. We have a very robust pass our system here in Washington. Um, and then we need a negative COVID test right now. Facilities are able to set their guideline on how recent that COVID test needs to be. I don't know of any facility that will go longer than 48 hours. We're doing 24 hours during this Omnicrom fun stuff then we only really want you if, we, if you need us, right? So we are really looking for that skilled need, that IV antibiotic, that daily wound care, or do you need therapy that is greater than three times per week? If you can get better in your own home, stay there. <laughs> you know, Don't come to us. We, we only really wanna take care of folks that need that level of care. If the facility is like Mission, where I work, we need you to have a discharge plan because we don't offer any long-term care. We don't have those beds for holding onto you while we figure out social work-wise where your next step is. Um, and most of our residents do come directly from the hospital, unless it's a hospice situation where they may come from home with a hospice agency following them and helping us get a hold of all of these records. So who pays for this? Uh, if you are there, again, we have two service lines, right? So skilled nursing, long-term care, and then the rehab side. So if you are in a nursing home for long-term care, uh, private funds could be paying for your stay. I will tell you that the daily rate runs anywhere from 375 a day upwards. So it is quite costly. Um, and you know, depending if you're in a shared or a private room, Long-term care insurance may help with that cost as well. If you're service connected, meaning that the reason why you need long-term skilled care is from some service that you did as a veteran, then the VA may pay for your long-term care, but they also have their own specific skilled nursing facilities. Um, the old soldier's home in Ording is one. I know there's one on the peninsula as well. And then Medicaid. Medicaid in Washington state will pay for long-term skilled care once you have been assessed to need that level of care. So um, the facilities that are kind of half long-term care and half rehab, most of the people who are there for long-term care are there under a Medicaid benefit. And that may be why they're there. There just is not a lot of resources, as Tina mentioned, for assisted livings to accept Medicaid. And so some folks do end up living in nursing homes on Medicaid because there's just no other resource for them. So if you are in skilled nursing for rehab, 
And so you've been in the hospital, something has happened, a stroke, um, hip replacement, knee replacement, can't go home straight from the hospital. Medicare, traditional Medicare is gonna pay for your rehab after three midnights in the hospital. It's COVID though, it's pandemic, right? So we don't want folks in the hospital if they don't need to be there. So certain rehabilitation centers have been approved to work with certain hospitals and bring folks in for rehab under a waiver in less than three midnights. Mission does have the waiver program in both their buildings. I won't bore you with the complications of how we got that, it's quite complicated. Um, and then if you have a managed Medicare plan, so if you have Humana, if you have United Healthcare, if you have Kaiser, your managed Medicare may pay for rehabilitation um, if, if you have a pre-authorization and there's going to be only certain facilities that you can go to. Whereas with traditional Medicare, as long as you meet the skilled criteria, you can go to any facility you want. They're all Medicare certified. Commercial insurance for younger folks may have a rehab benefit um, the VA will pay for rehab. Uh, certain facilities have uh, contracts with LNI, and then managed Medicaid for folks that are younger that's on a, a managed Medicaid plan with Preauth will also pay for short term rehab. Most facilities will not do private pay for rehab um, because it gets incredibly expensive very quickly with the PT and OT and the speech therapy needs. And usually um, those people can be served on an outpatient basis. So this is my soapbox. I could go on and on and on and on and on about this forever, but the highlights of the difference between Medicare versus managed Medicare, you know, everyone needs to look at their own finances. Everyone needs to look at their own needs, their health needs, but, but do know there is a huge difference um, between traditional Medicare and managed Medicare. So with traditional Medicare, and what I mean by that is A, B, and C, you, or sorry, A, B, and D, A, B, and D, you can go to any Medicare certified facility with that qualifying hospital stay or during the pandemic with the uh, waiver. You have a hundred day benefit period. Um, you can receive up to three hours a day of therapy. Day one through 20 is paid at a hundred percent with no copays. And then there's a copay starting on day 21 that changes every single year. And right now it's $195 a day this year. And the facility gets the highest reimbursement of any Medicare plan out there. So a big part of my job is reading referrals from the hospitals. And I can tell you that if someone has traditional Medicare, we know that we have the tools in our toolbox to get them back to their prior level of function more often than not. And we will say yes to that referral and we will try to help that person. When someone has a managed Medicare plan, such as Humana, United Health, Kaiser, um, there's a bunch of different ones on the market. Molina, you can only go to a contracted facility. So Kaiser has like five, it's very small contracts that they have. You don't have any control over that. They will not authorize you to go somewhere that is not contracted. The hospital has to help the skilled nursing facility to get you pre-authorization before you go to skilled nursing. There is a plan out there that that takes seven to 10 days to get that pre-authorization. So you are stuck in the hospital for seven to 10 days while someone at your managed Medicare is deciding whether or not you need to go to rehab. This to me is almost criminal because the stats are that every day in a hospital bed is three days in rehab. So you are deconditioning while you're waiting for your managed Medicare to make that determination. Once they pre-authorize you to go to rehab, the rehab facility has to send your notes every two to three, sometimes they'll give us a five day window. And if you are not making significant progress in your rehabilitation, they will stop paying for your stay. Whereas with Medicare, traditional Medicare, we treat you and we bill at the end and they hardly ever audit us. Um, the insurance determines if you have managed Medicare, how many minutes a day of therapy you get. So with traditional Medicare, it's up to three hours a day. I can tell you that there's a plan that authorizes 17 minutes of therapy a day, 17. So I've before had two folks the same age in the same room in a previous facility I worked in, one had managed Medicare, one had traditional Medicare, and the managed Medicare person thought we were neglecting her needs when really we had authorization to give her therapy 17 minutes a day for her massive stroke. Of course, she did not get better. Um, with the managed Medicare, they're all different, but most of them have co-pays that start on day one and all of them pay the facility about half of what traditional Medicare pays. So we are very, leery to um, help folks that have managed Medicare because we may not have the tools we need to get them back to their prior level of function. Do 
Do I have another slide, Tina? Yep. It's how to choose. Oh, a oh same. Yeah. Thank you. So how, how do you choose a rehab facility? This is really hard because no one ever thinks they're going to need us. You know, this is always my little line. No one thinks they need me, but my beds are always full. So <laughs> obviously people end up in rehab. Um, so because most folks do come to us from the hospital or a, a hospice situation, there is a discharge plan or a social worker, a care manager who is on your care team already, thank goodness, to help you with this. If you have managed Medicare, they're gonna know which facilities you're contracted with and which facilities more than likely uh, will accept your plan. So they're, they're a great resource. Um, that's kind of the starting place. The other thing I always recommend is going to medicare.gov backslash uh, nursing home compare. That is the only non-biased uh, web source. It is literally the Medicare website. They list on there the five-star ratings of all the facilities. And it's not five-star like when you talk about a five-star hotel or a five-star Michelin restaurant. The, these stars are based off of things like health inspections, staffing, quality measures such as um, wound care, people falling, uh, how many patients end up readmitted to the hospital. And it actually breaks it down. Every star is tied to a different quality measure. And you can see on Medicare.gov, Nursing Home Compare, uh, how many stars a facility has and in what area. So it's it's five stars for each category. Um, so they, and they look back three health inspections, which is pretty important. So if a facility just has a bad year, it's gonna factor in, but you can see all the health inspections for the last three years. And then tour, have your family go out and tour. Obviously you're gonna be in a position where you probably can't do that because you're in the hospital or, or you're passing away, but have your family tour, um, but do call ahead. <laughs> I used to always say, just pop in. You want to see how it smells without someone going through with aerosols or something. But due to COVID, we do have to limit how many bodies are in the building at any given time. And so do, do go ahead and um, make an appointment to tour. If you know that you are having a surgery that's going to require inpatient rehab, absolutely tour ahead. Go ahead of time, meet the staff, um, see the gym, find out what the accommodations are like. We do that a lot with folks who are planning for <clears throat> replacements and hip replacements that have a lot of stairs in the home or something else that's going to have them pop into rehab for a little bit after their surgery. You know, and I would add to that, if you are living in another senior care facility, whether that's an assisted living community or an adult family home, or even if you're living in an independent living community, it's a good idea to ask the staff there because most assisted living communities, nursing departments have pretty good relationships with the skilled nursing facilities in their general region. And they can, they can talk to you a little bit about what to expect and perhaps steer you in the right direction. And I think we're to the question session. That went really, really quickly and we would love to hear your questions. I've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Tina, I believe this one is for you. It came in right at the tail end of assisted living um, information, but it's asking, what if you are a vegetarian? So that's a question you are, you're going to want to ask when you are touring and looking into your assisted living options. Most communities are going to have pretty robust menu options. Um, and I would say that in most communities, you can get vegetarian options pretty regularly. If you have a highly specialized diet, you know, if you are gluten-free or you are a vegan or, or um, you have a lot of allergies, that is definitely something you're gonna wanna talk to the community about to see if they can accommodate, because that might be a little bit more challenging, but most communities are pretty good about being able to accommodate a vegetarian diet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then the next question I have, and this might be for both you and Nicole, our long-term care insurance requires licensed care be available 24 seven. What are the implications of this for assisted living or skilled nursing? So skilled nursing, you're definitely covered. Um, we have on-site, on-staff, awake staff that are RNs and LPNs 24 seven and a physician on call 24 seven. Tina, I'll let you answer the assisted living side of things. With assisted living, that's going to vary from community to community, and it's also going to vary from policy to policy. Um, with a lot of these long-term care insurance policies, they were written when assisted living really wasn't an option. 
And so you may move to an assisted living community that has a licensed nurse there 16 hours a day rather than 24 hours a day. And you may have to petition your long-term care insurance company to get them to pay in that scenario. You know, you're, you're looking to make sure that the community is providing sort of the spirit of the policy, if not exactly um, to the letter of the law, what the policy says you need to have. Um, and there are also some communities that may have uh, an LPN there 24 hours a day. It really is gonna depend. I would suggest that give a copy or take a copy of, of the policy to the community that you're interested in and have them kind of poke around and ask some questions and look at it to see if it's going to be something that, that their community is going to qualify for so that you'll be able to, to trigger it and utilize that in that particular setting. And I would absolutely second that as a former executive director of an assisted living. I always asked for a copy of the policy because as the executive director, I was the person who quarterly was getting the paperwork from the long-term care policy and certifying that it met, our services met the policy. And I never wanna say that I fudged things, but I definitely, you know, checked boxes that were accurate, but maybe it was that my nurse was on call 24 seven and my caregivers really did call her and FaceTime her. And so that I felt meant the spirit of the policy of a 24 hour licensed staff because she was 24 seven. She just was virtual sometimes. And all assisted living communities are going to have care staff there 24 hours a day. It really comes down to how much of a stickler your insurance policy is about having a licensed nurse in the building on site 24 hours a day. Honestly, most assisted living communities don't have a nurse 24 hours a day on site. Most have a nurse anywhere from eight to 16 hours a day. Some do have 24 hour nursing, um, but most insurance policies can be triggered without a nurse in the building on site 24 hours a day. It just might take a little bit of doing to make sure that they'll accept it. When you say that's accurate, Nicole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thanks ladies. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. Is there a difference between assisted living community and independent living communities? There is. They are in many ways very similar. An assisted living community is also a residential retirement community where you have your own apartment, you have um, some if not all meals provided. I think with most independent living communities it's one meal a day, but sometimes it's multiple meals a day. Um, your transportation and your activities and your utilities and all of those things that are included in your assisted living rental cost are also going to be available in an independent living community. The difference is if the community is solely an independent living community and does not have an assisted living component to it, you're not going to be able to get help with your activities of daily living. They're not going to be able to provide you with help with dressing and grooming or showering or medication management. Many communities are a combination of both assisted living and independent living where you might move in to your apartment and you are independent. You don't have a care plan. You know, you're managing all of your services on your own, but you want to be there because it's a very supportive environment. You know, they're doing the cooking and cleaning. The exercise programs are right there and available on site. So there's a lot of convenient services that, that uh, they provide that take some of that off your plate. So you can focus your energy on really staying independent and, and um, you know, living at your highest level of functioning for as long as possible. If they have an assisted living component, they, they can um, work in a couple of different ways. When you need assisted living services, in some situations, you may have to move out of your independent apartment and move to a different section of the building or move to an apartment that is licensed to provide assisted living services. In other situations, you may, be, you may live in a community that has a flexible licensing option available. And what that means is that as an independent resident, you know, you've chosen the apartment you wanna live in. And then if you need to add assisted living services, rather than moving to another apartment, that community simply applies an assisted living license to the apartment that you're already living in so that then you can go on to assisted living services. So it's a pretty simple switch to make. The difference, of course, independent living, no care plan. Assisted living, you're gonna have a care plan. And with assisted living, all of your meals are always going to be included. Whereas in independent living, some of your meals are going to be included. And you'll probably have some options with meal plans. 
Great. Thank you, Tina. Absolutely. That's a great question. I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. I'll give it just another minute to see if anybody's typing them in right now. Okay. Well, and Nicole is a great person to ask because she's been both in skilled nursing settings. And as she mentioned, she was an executive director within the assisted living world for a while too. So she's really got a good feel for the differences. So while you got her here, she's a good person to ask. And I grew up in a nursing home. My mom was a nursing home nurse. So she worked an op shift and brought me because she couldn't afford childcare. So I've literally been in long-term care since I was seven. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Feel free to keep typing if you do have one. Um, but we just wanted to thank Nicole and Tina for your amazing presentation today. This was so informative and, and so helpful to really learn the differences between these, these two types of communities. Um, for everyone that's here today, we're going to be emailing you an evaluation form. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, if there's any suggestions that you have for future Zoom events, please do share that. We're always looking to improve. But thank you so much for attending. Um, if you have questions about University House Issaquah specifically, feel free to reach out to me. Our phone number is 425-557-4201. Oh, and we've got a couple more questions. Um, so we are recording this presentation. I can send out that recording once it's all finalized. Uh, it might be in the next couple days. But Tina and Nicole, um, we have a question if we can get a copy of the presentation slides, if that's possible. Absolutely. I will email those to Savannah to send out. Perfect. Well, we will get all of those sent out to you as, along with the evaluation form. But thank you, Nicole and Tina again. And thank you all for being here today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.